Welcome to part 3 of Elementary Electroplating Experiments. This episode is called A Quick Look at the Chemistry and Making an Electroplating Rig. In the first two episodes, I thought that using the contents of my acid bath, using a copper anode and the part that I wish to plate as the cathode, would probably work okay, but it did not. I've been reading up on the science of electroplating and electrolysis in general, and it's a minefield, so I'm only going to just touch on it. If you want to find out more about electroplating and detailed chemical information, just type electroplating, electrolyte or electrolysis into the Google search bar. From what I've been reading, you can make your own electrolyte, but it's easier just to buy a bag of very pure copper sulphate. Quite a few of the videos that I've watched about electroplating said to use a chemical called root kill. But after having a good look on the UK versions of Amazon and eBay, I couldn't find any. I like to do things as well as I can, so it's a good idea to buy the right stuff. A lot of the tree root killer that I looked at was also described as weed killer, so I don't think that's going to make the best electrolyte. Now on to a bit of chemistry. I want to copper plate some parts. And if you have a solution of copper sulphate, the electrolyte should contain positive ions. These are known as cations, and these cations are reduced at the cathode to the metal in the zero valence state. Even though I passed my chemistry O-level exam when I was at school, and I'm actually quite interested in chemistry, electroplating is a fairly simple process, but it's not quite as easy to do as you think. To explain it very simply and quickly, if you pass an electric current through the electrolyte, the electrolyte breaks down. And because this electrolyte is copper sulphate, copper is deposited on the cathode, which is the part you want to plate with the metal, and you get a lot of bubbles on the anode. The chemical formula for copper sulphate is CuSO4, as far as I can remember from my school days, and copper sulphate is made by dissolving copper in sulfuric acid, and the blue powder is the precipitate which has been dried. I need to turn it back into a liquid form. So I bought a couple of these. These are really good quality food containers. I bought two sizes and they're both airtight and watertight. One of the containers is bigger than the other one if I need to plate anything a bit bigger. Health and safety warning. What you're about to see can be very dangerous. You don't want to get this stuff on your skin. You certainly don't want to get it in your eyes. Some personal protective equipment, also known as PPE, is very important for this job. Eye protection and a pair of rubber gloves is a good idea. This part isn't so dangerous. I've borrowed this piece of chemical apparatus from my windowsill. I need to measure the quantities and I'm really not sure about this so I'm still experimenting. I put 500 millilitres into this plastic container. Then I put the plastic container in the microwave just to warm up the water to make it easier to dissolve this stuff, the copper sulphate powder. I'm going to use a stainless steel spoon to stir the mixture. I found this one that I never use right at the back of the kitchen drawer. In this plastic bag is 500 grams of copper sulphate. And here I'm tipping three quarters of the bag into the distilled water. It looked to me like there was far too much powder and not enough water. But I went ahead anyway because I can always add some more distilled water to the mix. I'll just put a little bit more in, as they say, a bit more for look. And now there is three quarters of 500 grams of copper sulphate in the tub. I'm sorry to be so primitive. I have a measuring jug for the liquid, but I don't have any scales to weigh out the copper sulphate. The general consensus of opinion from the videos I watched stated that 100 grams of copper sulphate to two cups of distilled water is about right. And by cup, what sort of cup do they mean? So I googled that, and apparently one cup full of water is really one pint. One cup is 250 millilitres, and if that isn't correct, I do apologise. Now comes the dangerous part, I have to stir this. I'm not wearing any rubber gloves because I find it impossible to operate the camera. So, I'm adopting a different principle. I'm not putting my hand in the copper sulphate solution. 
In goes another warmed in the microwave flask of distilled water, another 500 millilitres. And now it's time for a bit of gentle stirring. You don't need to whip this stuff up, just stir it gently and it will dissolve. After a while, tip the tub very slightly and if you can see powder on the bottom, you need to stir it a bit more. And if, after stirring it a bit more, you can still see powder on the bottom, then you have a saturated solution, so you will need to add some more distilled water. I made a special pair of electrodes, these are flat pieces of copper. As you can clearly see, I drilled a hole in each plate and fitted a pair of brass 4B8 nuts and bolts. And here's the principle, one of these down each side of the tub should be okay. This clip shows how I propose to hold the plates upright in the tub. I've connected the positive terminal of the power supply to this one. These banana plugs that fit into the power supply allow me to plug another plug into a cross hole fitted to each of the plugs. I split one of these double leads and connected the single red lead to the other electrode that's in the electrolyte. You may be thinking, why do you need to use copper for the electrodes? You could use a couple of carbon rods, but then what's going to happen is, as the plating occurs, the copper sulphate mixture would get very weak in the copper department. The whole point of using copper electrodes is that you're constantly replenishing the copper in the copper sulphate. In this clip I'm dangling the part that I want to copper plate into the mixture. For the moment I'm just using a piece of copper pipe to support the part in the electrolyte. Not a very professional arrangement I know but it will do for now. Now here is the question, what about the electricery? I've seen a few videos about electroplating where the people show using two dry cell batteries in series to supply the power. But I would rather use a power supply because at least I know how much current and voltage has been applied at any given time. 3 volts seemed a very good place to start. And the 3 volts is travelling through the electrolyte at 0.81 of an amp. I left it like this for a bit but I did experiment by turning the voltage up and then the current increased dramatically so I went back down to 3 volts. As you're watching this video you may be thinking what's this an mp3 player? No, it's an air pump. And it's a really great air pump is this, I do like it, I'll switch it on. This cost £21.99, there are cheaper ones out there, but this allows you three speeds and it's battery powered. Rechargeable battery powered in fact, and you charge it via a USB lead which plugs into the power supply, how very convenient. It even comes with the charge lead, so now I'm going to plug it in because the battery is showing one bar low. Once I plug it in, the battery indicator tells me that it's charging. This is a really good piece of kit, perfect for the job. And it even has a function, when you see the M, that's in economy mode, and it will switch off for a minute. Time to fit the silicone rubber tubing. The first thing I attached to the rubber tubing, apart from the unit itself, was a one-way valve. This stops any of the liquid getting back into the pump if the pump is ever lower than the liquid. This is the airstone diffuser that goes into the copper sulphate mixture. And when I turn it on, the air that bubbles through the electrolyte is like stirring it because apparently you have to keep it moving. I still have a few questions as to where to position this for the best operation. Do you position it in the middle? close to the part that's been electroplated, or do you put it near the electrodes? I'll find out in due course. Apart from the short piece of brass bar that's currently been plated, I wondered what would happen if I put a 10 pence piece in the mixture as well. I didn't alter the voltage on the power supply, it's still at 3 volts. After 2 or 3 minutes I couldn't wait to have a look at the coin and to my surprise, even after such a short time, it had turned a very coppery colour. At last, a positive result. I placed it back into the mixture to let it marinate for a bit longer. There is, I suppose, a bit of a warped logic in turning a silver coin copper coloured. I've only just started the experiment, and I'm already ten pence down on the deal.
I thought I'd turn the power up to 4 volts and see what happened. Look at the current rise. So I turned it down to 1.5 volts and the current went back to where it was at 3 volts and then it dropped a bit lower. Being impatient, after 10 minutes I removed the copper coin and rinsed it in some water. I thought it would be a good idea to see whether or not the copper was stuck to the coin and even though it did rub off with some scotch bright, the depth of copper plate in such a short time was encouraging. And what about the piece of brass bar that's been in the bath now for 20 minutes? Well, it's definitely copper plated, but there are some striations on the surface of the metal. The question is, did this occur at the point when I was turning up the voltage to silly voltages like 12 volts, with a massive increase in the amperage? Or is it something to do with the air stone bubbling away too close to the part being plated? The whole point of these experiments is so that I can copper plate brass caps for chimneys. This chimney is off my simplex locomotive and it's made from gun metal. The part is physically larger and the amperage went up considerably. I didn't get good results with the chimney, but the plating on the brass bar is not bad at all. I lowered it in a bit deeper and here you see the result. I can definitely feel a ridge between the plating. This is the first productive experiment that I've done. I just need to refine the operation. You may be wondering what all this cost, and not really much for what it is. The power supply $72.99, plastic containers for the two of them £14.78, the air pump $21.99, what a bargain, the cabling $9.99, the distilled water $11.99, and the copper sulphate £6.20 a grand total of £137.94. If you want to have a go yourself without spending money on power supplies and things, it's a lot cheaper. That's it for the first attempt. I'm now going to try another attempt and see if I can get it better. Stay healthy, thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainstream Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back, making it unnecessary to comment that the videos are too short.